All right. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm super excited to host Richard Tinkler today from his uh, apartment in New York City. Um, hi, Richard. Thank you. Um, my name is Michelle Raymond, and I am the director of Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks here at Clark College. Um, we have a ton of fantastic programming this year. We've been entirely virtual um, geez, since last June. It's been almost a year at this point. Um, but we've still been rocking it and still doing a ton of um, events and art talks and exhibitions. Um, so just a lot of really fantastic things going on. Um, next up after um, Richard's talk, um, we have Tamara Seal. Um, and she is a fantastic um, Southern California light and um, color sculptor and installation artist. Um, so that'll be really fantastic. Um, two weeks from today, May 14th at noon, come back for that. Um, we have also extended um, our exhibition, our current exhibition, which is called Calm Under the Waves in the Blue of My Oblivion by Yulia Pink Yusevich. Um, we're gonna have that up through um, the middle of May while we um, get our um, art student annual rolling. Um, so our next exhibition is going to be the Art Student Annual 2021 exhibition, and that will open June 4th. Um, any Clark College art students can apply, and I encourage you all to apply. So any Clark art students that are on the call right now, um, check your emails because I sent you one. Um, check your junk emails because maybe it went to that, um, but the application is in there. So please do um, apply. I encourage you to. If you've taken an, a Clark art class in the last year, um, you've made art for one of those courses, you are eligible to apply. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to get in touch and all the contact information is, um, is in those emails. So lots to look forward to coming up in the next few months. Um, I would love to say some thank yous. Um, thank you first, of course, to Richard for being here today. Um, thank you as well to the um, ASCC, the Associated Students of Clark College, um, for funding and support this whole year and every year. Um, we wouldn't be here without you. Um, thank you, of course, to the art department. Um, Lisa has been to lay almost every one of our events. Thank you so much for coming and supporting us, Lisa. Um, thank you to Sensony Stokes, Grant Hoddle, Katharina Halsinger, Sally Tomlinson, Jean Bybee, Miles Jackson, and many others um, as well for, for coming and supporting um, all of our programming. Um, so with all the thank yous out of the way, uh, I'd like to introduce renowned abstract painter Richard Tinkler. Um, I've been admiring Richard's work from afar on Instagram of all places for the past year or two. Um, he's an incredibly prolific artist who often produces um, a piece or two a day and posts the work to um, Instagram online for everyone to see. The pieces are hypnotic and enticing, full of meditative intrigue and thoughtful, meticulous process. His colors are often otherworldly and candy-like. Gems and textiles come to mind immediately, but there's also a lot that is unseen. Um, a veil of sorts um, is kind of how I think about it and how we talked about it the other day together. Um, that covers whatever is underneath. Um, his pieces make the viewer dig. And as an artist myself who craves another reason to look longer at a brightly colored, well-crafted piece, the world beyond the beauty keeps me there, asking questions and holding my attention. In other words, Richard's work is stunning um, and you all will be able to see um, a bunch of his work in just a few minutes here. Um, Richard Tinkler was born in 1975 in Westminster, Maryland and grew up in Garland, Texas. He received a BFA from the University of North Texas and an MFA from Hunter College. He has shown his work in group shows in Europe and the USA and has solo shows at 56 Henry in New York City and Albert Marola Gallery in Provincetown, Massachusetts. His work has been reviewed in the New York Times and the New Yorker and his work will be included in a group show at Albert Marola Gallery in Provincetown this summer. He lives and works in Brooklyn, New York where he is right now. Um, it is my pleasure to host Richard today from a studio in Brooklyn. Please help me welcome renowned artist Richard Tinkler. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and thank you all for joining this artist talk. So I thought I would um, start out by talking a little bit about my like biography and where, where I come from and, and then talk about my work. So I was, as, as was stated, I was born in 1975 in Westminster, Maryland, which is like a kind of a rural 
area. It's kind of near Pennsylvania and it's like, um, it's not like a cultural center. And my family was like, is, they still exist. They're like fundamentalist Christians. And I actually um, had a really wonderful childhood, but it was divorced from reality in a lot of ways, but it was really wonderful. It was like a lot of family. And, uh, but even as a small child, I kind of had, I started to realize that I was a little bit different. And, and there was like, it was like, but it was pretty wonderful. And then when I was nine years old, my family moved to Texas. And this was a huge change. It was like an incredible like trauma basically in my, in my childhood. And, and the whole kind of like world order that I had known, it didn't exist anymore. And now there was all these different kinds of people that I, I'd never really met before at all these like pop culture and like all kinds of different things. And it was a real, it, it took me a long time to adjust to it all through, like through middle school and maybe like half of high school. And I, I ha had a pretty tough time. I didn't really fit in. I, it was really hard for me to fit in. I didn't fit in with my family. I didn't really fit in with like, I was like a working class neighborhood. I didn't really fit in. I didn't, I wasn't good at anything. You know, usually in these situations, the person telling the story will be like, well, I was really good at school and that saved me, but I wasn't. <laughs> And so the teachers didn't really know, like, they were like, well, I don't know what to do with you. So I just kind of like existed. But then towards the end of high school, I started making friends. And I, and I, a lot of these friends were artists, like artists or musicians. Um, and so I, this gave me a very positive feeling about art. And then, um, you know, I, when I graduated from high school, I didn't know what to do. And and so I went to community college, which turned out to be really awesome. It was a really great experience for me. I made even more friends. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I got to tr try out different things. And, um, and then one of, I became friends with this guy and he was, he was an artist and he wanted to be an artist and he was gonna go to the University of North Texas, which was like a larger school in that area. And he's like, you should just come with me. And I went with him. And I, but I still wasn't an artist. So I was just taking different classes, but it was really, I was enjoying it. Like it was like, so, you know, it was like, I had a good experience at community college and now I've moved to this other college and I was starting to take classes there. And um, then, I, oh, and I was I, taking out student loans, you know, I was working at Target and taking out student loans. And I, um, I needed to take some summer classes so that I could keep getting student loans. You know, I didn't want to lose my loans during the summer. But I wanted some kind of classes that would be fun. So I took this watercolor class with Millie Giles. I remember Millie Giles. She had, one of the reasons it's easy to remember her name, even though this was a really long time ago, is that she had an MG, those little cars that are, in, and the license plate was like MG's MG. <laughs> and um, I took this class. And on the first day of class, she was like, she's like, there's people who need to take this class for their for to graduate or whatever and so if you don't have the prerequisites you've got to get out and i didn't have the prerequisites and i didn't say anything i just stayed in the class and i loved it it was like so much fun uh like everyone else was making i i'm sure they're wonderful people but they were making like blue like it's texas so they're making like blue bonnet paintings you know um, which is fine too they're beautiful there's some beautiful blue bonnet paintings um but they're like really uptight and i was making like crazy abstract on like really textured paper with like too much paint. And, and Millie was really into that. So I had a really great time and she had lots of suggestions for different things I could try. And it, I remember the last day of class, we had to like put all of our paintings up in the hallway. And so I put all my paintings up and she came out and she was like, she was like, you know, I could have kicked you out of this class at any time. And I was like, I, I was like, I know. She's like, but I'm glad I didn't. And I was like, me too. And then I like went back and I changed my major and I took all the classes I was supposed to take, you know, design and drawing, and color, and, and I loved it. And it was really like, I finally had something that I looked forward to doing. Like I was happy to be in school. I made good grades. I, um... But then uh, when I graduated, this was like 1999 when I finished with college finally. It took me a little while, but I finally finished. And then I was like, didn't know what to do. It, it was kind of a different time. Like if you, like nowadays you can kind of live, I feel like you really can kind of live anywhere. But back then you really felt like you, if you wanted to be an artist, you kind of had to move to the city. 
And I didn't know anything about New York City. I'd never been, well, I'd been there once for like a couple of days, but I'd basically never been there. I, um, like most of what I knew about it was based on things that had happened like in the 60s and 70s, you know, <laughs> like Lou Reed and Andy Warhol, like that. I mean, I didn't know anything about like modern New York. I just moved there. I had like $300. I knew one person, but she fortunately had a room I could rent. So I, I got a job at Pearl Paint. Oh, but the other great thing is I had this teacher in, um, in college, uh, Annette Lawrence, who's a great artist. I, I still think so. She had grown up in New York and she was like, well, you know, Richard, you should just apply to grad school. Just, I was like, what's grad school? She's like, just apply. She's like, there's this place called Hunter College. It's really cheap. It's part of this city university of New York and, and um, just apply to it. So I applied to it, but I kind of forgot about, I, did, I didn't even really know that it was hard to get into grad. I mean, it was easier back then, but I didn't really, I didn't really think much about it. But fortunately for me, I got in <laughs> because otherwise I don't, I would have had a totally different experience because then like I um, got to meet lots of artists who lived in, New York and I, you know, who I'm still friends with now, all these years later. And um, it was, it was, so that was my like educational experience. Then when, when I got out of grad school, I, um, what I was making was nothing anyone wanted to see, <laughs> but somehow this didn't bother me and I kept making it. And there was maybe like 10 years where I didn't, where I, I mean, I occasionally showed my work, but I didn't pretty much didn't show it. And it didn't, I, I wasn't really bothered by it. I, those were great years too. I had a lot of fun and it was good times. And, um, but then eventually, and this might be something people are kind of interested in too, is like, how does that change? Especially after so many years. But I had a, a friend who was a more, well, we weren't really friends then, but there's this artist, Jack Pearson, who you may have heard of because he was on the cover of Art Forum last month, but he's a photographer and a sculptor and he was putting together this, um, kind of zine thing where he was going to take different his work and other artists work and collage it together with ephemera and nothing was going to be labeled and all the images are like mixed up and then there's just like a list of names and uh, he asked me to contribute something to this and I was like that sounds great and my some of my friends I remember some of them were like I don't know if that's a great idea I was like that's a great idea I love it because I love the idea that my work is like part of the world like the it, abstraction is not like like I see abstraction as being firmly like part of my, ex coming out of my experience in the world. So to me, it sounded like a great idea, but then, the, but of course it doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But then what happened is he um, ended up curating these group shows based on those books in all these galleries, like in Paris and Austria and LA and New York. And so then people started seeing my work and also the experience of showing it in these group shows kind of pushed me to like, kind of like, it kind of, I ended up making better work, more people saw it, and then I started getting other shows. So that was kind of how that, he really kind of stepped in and helped me out. And, um, you know, now sometimes I get to have shows. <laughs> so now I guess we can look at, I have some images to show you. Do you need help with that, Richard? You good? What do I do? Hit the share screen? Hit share screen, yeah. Okay, here we go. Photos. Okay. Yay, great. looks great. Okay. So this is a recent painting. Um, and this is kind of, um, all the work I'm showing you is recent because I, that's just what I wanted to do because I that's the work I'm most into right now. But it's all, you know, it, it um, things are constantly coming back. So it all, it relates to my other work too. But so this is like um, the, a painting like this, I do it all at once. It's not that big, it's 30 by 40 inches, which is, a, it, it's a, a kind of standard, one of my standard sizes that I use over and over again. And to me, it's kind of like, a, it, it's, I like it because it's a little bit extreme. Like it's kind of like a portrait. You know, it's like two sides are much longer than the other sides. So this kind of stretches the image. And, and a lot of times there ends up being kind of like a figure, like a figure, almost like a figurative element in the abstraction. Maybe not so much in this one, but anyway. So, so when I, so I paint these basically, not all of them, but a lot of them, I paint them in one day. And I'll like lay down these layers of wet paint. Like in this, there's all these like kind of like wedges of paint. 
And then I would drag a brush through it to make these marks and it kind of moves the paint around to create the kind of image. Um, and also a lot of times I, I have a plan for the painting and it doesn't, it almost never works. And so there's a kind of a process of like making adjustments and reworking it during the day. So this painting, uh, it started out totally different. It started out totally different. And I kind of, I think I like scraped it down a few times or something, and then it ended up, this is how it ended up. So that's kind of like the, the process is there's a lot of planning and there's a lot of things kind of not working. And then, but that provides like a platform that for something to happen. So that's always, it's kind of the best, the paintings where nothing bad happens are kind of like, okay, but the ones that are like really bad and then I have to like try to fix them, but those are always the ones I like the most. Okay, and here, I, this is kind of like a view of my st studio, which is not enormous. Um, I kind of work in a small space. It's also where I live. And this is kind of like the wall that I paint on. And I have, you know, this table where I like lay out my paints and I can kind of like, and I can move the painting like up and down on the wall and like, like kind of like move it around. And then I have the other paintings are like all around me. So I have kind of like, they kind of like, other like kind of influence, like I want the painting that I'm working on to kind of like react against them or like fit in with them. So I kind of have them around, around on all the walls. And this is another recent painting, which is kind of quite different in that I don't paint it all at once. This, these paintings are painted over like a, maybe a week because it takes a long time to paint all these little triangles. Um, but the, um, the idea with this is that they're, oh, in this, oh, and so like in this one, there's more of like a figure. So that's a good example of that. There's like a figure and a ground and the figure and ground are made up of the same thing. They're made up of all these triangles. So like one thing about, like you might ask yourself, why make abstract paintings? Like it's so pointless. Um, like what is an abstract painting? But to me, it, it's like, a, the thing that's interesting about abstract painting is that it's a way to talk about like how, how you exist in the world through the metaphor of figure and field. So it's like, um, it's like the fact that in the, so in these paintings you have like a, a figure in the middle that's exerting this like force out. It's like affecting like how, how a person feels like they're affecting the world, but then like the edges are pushing in and like the whole like feel, it's like the forces are going in both directions. There's a force pushing out from the center and a force pushing in and how these two things are kind of like coming to some kind of equilibrium. That's kind of like how, that's like kind of how I feel it exists, how I feel it is to exist in the world at that point. You know, I'm trying to express that. And then in each painting, it's kind of a different, like different, kind of like, this is how it feels today. This is how it feels today. This is how it feels today. So they're all a little bit different. Um, so, but I like the idea that you're never really quite sure, like in this painting, you can identify different things as figure, like different, there can be like several figures um, or one, or like sometimes you don't know, like, is this part of the field or is the, is the figure all, is the field all figures or all figurative, you know? So that I think is, that's what interests me, if that makes any sense. I don't know. Okay, here's another one. This, this one also has kind of like the figure and field thing. And it's all, this is all wet into wet. And there, it's kind of done in two layers. There's a layer that's kind of like these bigger areas of color. And then I blur the whole thing with like this like brush so that it gets kind of dark. And then I go back over it with a littler brush and scratch into the paint. And this reveals the kind of brighter colors underneath. So you kind of get these two layers, one of these like lines where you're seeing the brighter color and then the kind of muddier color from where I blurred it. Hey Richard, do you have names for these? Like, um, can you tell us as we go? I know that- That is a good <laughs> question. I don't, I, the, I went to a period, the paintings in like 2018 and 2019 all got titles. And I, and this came, I was at an artist talk and, um, the artist, it was an abstract artist, and she was like, you know, the title is a way for people to get into the work. It's like, I love that. I'm gonna start giving my works titles. And I did several shows where everything was titled. But then I thought about it and it was great for that work. And then I was like, 
I felt like the titles were kind of limiting the work. And so then I went back to something I used to do, which is these just have numbers. They have numbers because I don't, I want the viewer, I want the, the I don't want to like tell the viewer how to look at it. Like I want you to decide how you're gonna look at it. And so, and they have a certain relationship to each other, which the numbers are a little bit about, um, but that doesn't have to, that doesn't have to be something. I don't like, I can't remember what the name of this title, what the title of this painting is off the top of my, off the top of my head, but they do, they do, there is a reason for the number, but it's like, you know, but they're basically, they don't have titles anymore. But also I like in this one how like, look like there's this kind of red shape in the center and like the top of the red shape is kind of like a little bit exploding. Like that's, that's the kind of stuff I didn't really plan in this painting, but then like it kind of started happening as like, oh, that's, so it's kind of like things happen as I'm going along and then I just kind of go with it. So that's really important too. I think most artists would agree with that, that that's part of the fun of it is that you, um, you, I, you know, I try to have like a real openness when I'm, when I'm working in the studio. If I have an idea for anything, I say yes to it. I try it out. The worst thing that happens is you make a bad painting and who even knows what a bad painting is? Like maybe it, it'll, you know, so once you start saying no to ideas, you never know when to say yes again. So I, I really think, I've, I feel very strongly about, about the, the, when you're making something, you need to be in this phase where you're just saying, you're just like saying yes and doing whatever comes to mind. But then you have to also like be able to stop and like switch to like this totally different mindset that, that's very critical. <laughs> and it's not like accepting at all and then make decisions that way too. But if you can kind of go back and forth. Um, and one thing I do a lot of times now um, is I'll try to do that in the middle of a painting, stop being accepting and like think, what well, could it be done now? Just like at random points in the painting, could it be done now, <laughs> for example? Or could I do something totally different, you know? And I think that's really, fu that's really fun too, because it's, um, it's kind of like a mental exercise to try to kind of like see, it's a different kind of openness, being, being like not open. And here's, oh, and okay, so here's another kind of painting where there's all the little sections filled in, but this time it's not, um, it's not triangles. It's like, well, some, well, no, they're not triangles. Do I know my shapes? <laughs> there's like uh, rectangles, but some of the rectangles are very distorted, you know? And I think that the, um, you know, one thing about the, especially in this painting, it has a very decorative, like it seems to relate to like textiles or like the, the decorations you might see like an inlaid table or something, you know? And I, um, you know, when I grew up, I wasn't like going to museums. I didn't like, I came to this stuff pretty late. So I have a very, I feel like I, I feel like abstraction is everywhere and I, and I'm open to all of it. And I'm just as, just as influenced by, like, I don't think that, abstract painters invented abstraction. I don't think they would have even thought about it that way. You know, I think that's something that, that people tried to, a story people tried to tell after the fact. And abstraction is something that has happened, always happened, you know, by like, you know, craftsmen and women, all different kinds of people in all different kinds of way. And I think, and it's not that I'm trying to like, and this is an important distinction. I don't think that like by turning it into a painting, I'm making it art or like more valuable, but I do think that I, as a person who makes these kinds of paintings, it's important to be open to all these things. And if I denied that as part of the world of abstraction, I think that would be, that, that would be horrible. So, and another thing that's really interesting that I don't know why, a lot of things I do intuitively, like why are all the paintings centered? I don't know, but it just feels right to me. So I just do it. Um, and. I think that's important as an artist. Like a lot of times you won't have a reason for something, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. The, you, you'll figure it out later. You know, you don't, sometimes you know, sometimes you think you know things ahead of time and then you're wrong. That's, I'm wrong. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been wrong about something. What's next? Let's see. Oh, here's another. Okay, so here's another painting that's kind of like the, has the blur and then the kind of scratch back into the blur. Um, I, in a lot of these recent paintings, I've been expanding my palette. And um, like these two different yellows, like the kind of like pale lemony yellow, and then the like the more like darker, I mean, it's kind of weird. 
I don't know, just like, it was just something I was trying out, like try out some, I mean, it's weird. There's kind of like not that many different colors when you think about it. And yet still somehow when you can come, you know, sometimes that's something to think about, you know, the different colors that your paintings can be. Oh, and here's a drawing. I also make drawings. Um, this is a, this is 11 by 14 inches and I make it with micron pens, which are these little pens that you can find at any uh, art supply store, but they're really cool. They're like from Japan and they come in different colors and different sizes. So it gives you a lot of options. And the thing I like, well, when I first started making drawings like this, I made them with ballpoint pens, which are super unstable. Like you leave it out for like a couple of days and the ink will totally change color. Like it'll go to rust, like a rusty brown or something. So this was a more stable version. Um, but I like that the, it's like a ballpoint pen, it like dries immediately. So it's very, it's like when you're working on it, it's never wet. So I liked that about it. Richard, there's a question in the chat. Do you want to take questions as we go or do you want to wait till sure. the end? No, that's fine. Ask away. Okay. There's a question in the chat that says, um, how and when did you start making geometric paintings? Well, that's a good question. I, okay. So when I was in undergrad in Texas, I, um, my paintings were like, um, they were like on found, a lot of them were like on found textiles like on sheets or like vinyl tablecloths that I would get from the 99 cent store or from the thrift store. And they had a lot of things kind of attached to them, like taped to them. It was kind of like Rauschenberg or Jessica Stockholder or something like that. Um, but I definitely thought of them as paintings, like Jessica Stockholder kind of, you know, um, painting by other means. And they were usually pretty flat and I would like fold them up. They could be really big and I would like fold them up and take them places and unfold them. Um, but they weren't really like geometric abstraction necessarily. Although sometimes they, they but not necessarily. Then when I was in grad school, I, um, it kind of, my work fell apart. And for some reason this like really, this work just seemed so messy to me in New York, which was such a chaotic place. It, and I felt like I just need, since what I was, I was thinking about them like paintings, I just needed to make paintings. So then I started was, what am I gonna make a painting of? So I started by um, like drawing these simple shapes and kind of filling them in, like filling them in over like lines and filling them in with blocks of color. And the earlier ones were like Saturn, the planet Saturn, flowers, stars, things like that. And then at a certain point, I realized I didn't need this kind of like crutch of the, of the like recognizable thing. And I just let these little shapes fill in the whole surface. So that's kind of how it came about. And then I just kind of repeat them over and over again. So, so for years I've been making, I've been using these kind of similar like patterns and shapes and geometry and just like reworking them over and over again. There's another question too. It says, "How do you start a painting? Start a painting?" Well, that similar. I, I start them in the center, almost always, and work out to the edges. Um, and and I try to, and a lot of them, if there's layers, I try to just do one layer at a time. This I think is this is something that uh, Zyler Jane told me, who's an artist who I'm really influenced by. She was like, you know, it's don't skip ahead to the next layer until you're done the layer that you're working on. I was like, that's such good advice because it really does. You'll mess things, like if I get too far ahead of myself, I'll like mess it up. So yeah, start from the center, work out to the edges one layer at a time. Awesome. Um, I think people are asking about mediums too. Um, oh yeah, sure. This is a drawing, I think, um, but the last yeah. ones I think were oil. Yeah, the paintings that were are, are all oil on canvas. And then these drawings are pen on paper. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Sure, you should feel free to ask questions as we go. That's totally fine. Let's see what we got next. Oh, and here's another, okay. So here's another drawing that's recent. That's, um, it's, it's similar. You know, the way I think about them are similar, although it looks very different. But what I did in this drawing is I, is I, this uses, um, these pens come in 15 different colors. This uses all 15 colors and it starts with, 
in, in alphabetical order, starting with a line that divides the page in half, and then and then dividing each of those halves in half, and then all four of those halves in half, and then all 8, 16, 32, like that, until I've filled it in so far, I can't fill it in any further. And so that's like the, the structure of it. But the thing that makes it an interesting drawing is that at one point, the pen hit my finger. See that little bump towards the bottom? There's like a little bump. That's where like my fingers on the ruler and the pen hits, my fingers like hanging off the edge of the ruler and the pen hits it. And then, so for that other line, there's not enough room for it. And I have to like leave it, leave a little like gap there. And that actually turned it into a good drawing. <laughs> so yeah, if that hadn't happened, I don't know if the drawing would have worked. It might have, I don't know. So, so that's kind of an example of how you just, sometimes you just have to try things out and see what happens. There's so many questions now um, coming into the chat. Um, yeah. Um, do you ever get a uh, painter's block and have no ideas uh, what to paint? Well, I um, I don't rely. I mean, it, this makes it yeah. This makes it sound like I have lots of ideas, but I don't really rely on ideas. I basically just work all the time, and I um, like I I try to always have some things going. So, for example, I always have like the drawings kind of take a long time, so. I'll, if I have a day where I feel like I have a lot of, like I feel like have some ideas, I'll start a bunch of drawings and then I'll have them and then I can just like work on them. And a lot of times while I'm just like filling in, a, like there's a lot of just filling in. There's like certain days where you're just like filling in. You don't have to really think too much about it. But on those days, a lot of times, then I'll have like an idea for a painting. You're like, oh, that's good. <laughs> so then I like hold on to that. And then, um, so, and the, the trick I think to not having a block is to never say no. I think that's really, like I said before, if you, you know, even if it's like a stupid idea, just like try it and just see what happens. Sometimes just seeing it will make you think of something else that's a lot better, but you kind of have to, see it. you have to see the mistake first before you know like what to do right. So yeah, I don't, I don't think, you shouldn't wait for ideas. Also, yeah, you shouldn't wait for ideas to make work. You might never make anything. <laughs> I don't know. That's I my. Think that's opinion. really that's really good advice. I think for yeah. sure. My, for me, going. everything comes through the the work. Working, everything comes out of the work. That's why I make so much work. It's because I don't know how else to do it. Like I, I don't. It's not that I think it's so great. It's just the only way I have of getting anything done is to just make stuff. And um, I think that the it's really the what is what really matters to me and what I really kind of hold on to is the process. Like, I think you develop a process and you keep that kind of true to yourself, what feels right to you. And then, and I don't really worry about the, I'm, I'm not really that concerned at all with the product in a strange way. Like there's a lot of things about how it looks that I don't know, I don't know why I can't explain it. I don't know like the color or like, I don't know, but like the process I'm totally in control of. I feel like that is me and then and then it ends up, if you do that, the product ends up being okay. But if you try to make, like, if you try to make a beautiful painting, it's, I don't, like, I don't know, I don't know. You're, it's not gonna work out very well, I don't think. So it's, I don't know why, I don't know why painting is like that for me, but that's my experience of it. I love that. Okay, and here's another painting. And this is also a good example of a, I mean, drawing, sorry, I called it a painting, but it's obviously a drawing. It's pen on paper, 11 by 14 inches. And it's based on this, I made a, draw, a different drawing that there was a mistake in and it had this like wedge. And then I was like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe like the wedge part, I just won't fill it in as much. And then this is another drawing that I made with that same on purpose with this kind of wedge. So that, that was something that interested me about it. And this kind of form of the, this orange form is like something that's from work I made a long time ago. And they kind of came back in this drawing, which was exciting. So this kind of combination of like a kind of a form from a long time ago and um, this kind of new kind of break in the pattern that's a more recent development. And also like you can tell in the, towards the, like in the parts that are not the, like some parts are filled in more densely, like it's more of a hatch mark thing. And some are just like, just like parallel lines. And that creates a real kind of like difference between, between those two sections. And I can remember, you know, I've been making these hatch mark drawings for a long time and they're, they're I, I remember when I had the idea to do that, I was, 
I was at the Met and I was looking at these drawings and I was like, these drawings are like an old master drawings, like the hatch marks are great. I just love that, like how they, I mean, not that this is anywhere near as interesting, obviously I shouldn't even like bringing that up makes them look horrible, but I was just like in love with like the little grids that happen in the hatch marks, you know? I was like, I want to do that. So I just started doing it. Let's see what we have. Oh, and here's a recent painting that is like, okay, so this painting is like, a, it's oil on canvas, painted all at, at one time. And it's like a this kind of burst thing that I like to do. And then what I did after I painted the burst is I went back over the whole top with this little brush and I made all these little marks, you know, like these, these um, horizontal rows of little marks over the entire canvas, which kind of distorts the, um, kind of disrupts the image, but the, but the image and the disruption are all kind of part of the same thing. I, I should, maybe I should have included it. I made paintings a few years ago where there were like layers. There was like a layer that was like an image and then a layer that was like more of the disruption was a completely different layer painted at a different time. So the, then I wanted to make some where they're kind of like combined into one thing. And then also this is like, what I like about this is like, you're getting to see the image right before it comes to, it's like a, a painting of an image right before it comes together. Because these little like things could be like little pixels or something, you know, it's like, um, so it's like, you're like looking into the future, which I think kind of makes sense with this kind of, I mean, I do, there is something kind of mystical about this imagery. And I realized that kind of a spiritual mysticism. Um, and I think that this kind of like making it so that it's like, it's like you don't actually see it, but you have to imagine what it's gonna look like in the future. I think that kind of works with it, but that's also something that just happened. It just happened, you know? And I like I made paintings with these little marks over the surface before and I'd made burst paintings, but I'd never put them together. And then it just kind of, I made the burst painting and it didn't quite work out and it needed something else. So I just tried it and then this happened. And I was happy with it for now. Let's see what else we have. Oh, and here's another drawing. This is a drawing where, um, and it's based on a mistake, draw, a drawing where I started it and changed my mind. The only thing I did is I drew this one line from the center to the middle of the right side of the paper. And then for some reason that wasn't right. And I left it and I came back and I was like, oh, why don't I just draw these like lines all the way around like this? And um, yeah, and then I was, I thought that was really nice. It has a nice kind of spatial, that, you know, the thing is like, um, this is an interesting thing too, is like the space is so important, but a lot of times it's not something I really plan out ahead of time. Like the, like I'm not trying for any specific visual effect. Um, I just kind of let the, I let the material, the image kind of decide what the effect is. Like the effect has to work for that piece. It's not enough to just have like an effect. And here is a, a wall of little paintings, which are, you might see them here behind me. Um, 11 by 14 inches, oil on canvas. And with these, these are over the last few years. So like 2018 to 2021. And uh, I'm sorry, some of them are not straight. <laughs> um, and I just like, some of them I've gone back over time and time again. Um, but they're not actually more experimental than the others, I don't think. I think they're all kind of experimental, but this is just, I, I like with the little paintings to try to make things that seem very like big, like, cos like cosmic space on a really tiny scale. Because one of the interesting things about painting is that it's um, like, it's a way to take like an idea and turn it into this like movable chunk of something, but you can make like a really big idea into like kind of the small movable chunk so I think that the, that's what I like about the little paintings. So with them, a lot of times with them, I try to make them even more, I like seeing them kind of even more like bigger images on little or canvases. And I hate that people think that big paintings are more serious. That really drives me crazy. I, it's the worst idea. It's like really like, it's like, um, it's, a, it's a real tragedy. It's a, one of the biggest tragedies in the art world is that people think that large paintings are more serious. It, it leads to so many like, I mean, sometimes they are, it's true. And you can't rule it out. You can't rule anything out, but that people assume that it's led to so many like mistakes, huge mistakes. Oh, and here's another painting where it's kind of like the pattern thing that I like to do, but like blurred with the kind of like pixelies. 
The other thing about these, I don't necessarily, you don't have to see them as pixels. Another way I like to see them is that they're all, each little stroke is like a, is like an echo of the whole painting. It's like a little rectangle, like each one is like a little painting. But you don't have to see it that way either, but you could, it's something you can think about. Richard, someone asks, um, yeah. I read that you duplicate some of your pieces as a record for yourself. Can you talk about that? Yes. Okay, so this, okay, so for, this is, this came out of the drawings. And for years and years, no one, no one bought any of my drawings, which was great. I could just keep them all. And I kind of arranged them into these books and I, the ordering of them is very, really important and all this stuff. Okay, so then, um, what is also great, people wanted to buy the drawings, but I didn't know what to do. And so at first I tried to, um, to redraw them exactly, but it didn't work <laughs> because we, because in the process of redrawing them, you think of like other things to do and you can't help yourself. Like you just like, if you can think of something to make it better. So what I do now is that I have, um, i still make these like sequences of drawings, um, and there are certain things about each point in the sequence that are important and certain things that can change. So I do redraw drawings, but they're, but I don't redraw them exactly. Certain things I plan on certain things changing. And then I also allow for other things to just change as I redraw them. But the overall, see any kind of sequence that I'm working on, the, there are certain things about that that I do retain, you know, through the, through remaking drawings. And in a sense, all my work is really like, a lot of it is redo is doing the same thing over and over again. That's kind of my experience of making it is that I'm constantly doing the same thing over and over again anyway. So um, it kind of comes out of that. But it, it, I, I realize that it's kind of, we, it, it just sounds weird, but it's just something that came out of the work. Fantastic. We have a ton of other questions too, um, but maybe I'll save those till the end. I think we're almost through. Let's see. Awesome. Okay. And that, oh, I wanted to show you that painting from a distance. Kind of gives you a sense. Like you just walked away from it a little bit. And here's another one that's kind of like this pattern and it's, um, it has all the little marks on top of it. This one I think was particularly successful too, if I can say that. Oh, another thing I love about this painting is that the, is just from how it happened is the left-hand side is lighter which I think is, I, I like that. Um, just because it emphasizes that, like the, the pattern kind of follows the top and bottom, but then having that side lighter kind of emphasizes that the sides of the canvas. And that was something that just came out of making it. Oh, and this, okay. This is, this, I like, I like to make lots of monochrome drawings. So this is a drawing that's like one of these patterns similar to the other ones, but it's all filled in with the same color. And then here's a version of it filled in with different colors, but it's the exact same, the exact same lines. That's crazy, isn't it? So that, that drawing, I'm sorry, they're on different backgrounds. That's, I love to show them on wood backgrounds too, because it gives you an idea of the scale and it like puts them in the world. I don't know, it's weird, but. Oh, there, that's on wood too, just a different table. And then here is, this is a similar one, but this is colored, pen, I love to make colored pencil drawings. And this is, um, this is actually a large drawing, 18 by 24 inches. It took quite a while, maybe too long. Sometimes they take a little too long. They're like, was that worth it? I don't know, but I don't know. Oh, th this is a recent thing that I've been working on is that, tearing the paper and then um, using the kind of rough edges, following the rough edges and then filling in the center. Um, and these, the little like, it makes these like little cracks which echo the um, ragged edges. Here's another one filled in, like this one is filled in, like the color pencil in the center is not filled in solid. And then in this one, the center is filled in solid. So it gives you a really different space like that. And also the color makes a big difference too, but like the, what the space does. And here's one where there's like four little guys, four little red bits. Richard, there's and a great, sorry. There's a great question in the chat that says, what are the sort of mistakes you see artists making in the pursuit of large paintings? Well, I don't think it's a mistake the artists are making. I think it's a mistake the viewers are making. 
you know? <laughs> I love like, that. That's like thing. galleries and dealers and museums, they just have this idea that large paintings are serious. And that they, if you ask them about it, they would probably say, no, not at all. But they do, they just do. They just like, they have these large spaces, they need to fill them. They just like, it just, everything about it seems serious to them. And I think that it, um, it's actually much harder to make a small painting. But anyway, so here, like, here's like, this is like the other, like I showed you like the painting wall. And then this is a different wall in the studio where I just have like a bunch of paintings hanging up so that they can kind of influence the, the process. And I also like to see them. I spend time like looking at them together and this kind of gives me ideas about like what's working, what's not working, you know. Like I have a lot of ideas about these paintings right now. And I, there's a lot of stuff about these that I'm kind of not that excited about. Um, I feel like things are about to change again. And that's why like, I was just out of town for a while and I came back and I looked at these paintings and then I made um, this painting because I felt like those paintings were a little fussy and I was like, I want to try to make a painting that's bold. So, <laughs> but I, I, so that's, and that's my last image to show you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, this is amazing. There are so many questions. And like, as we were going kind of like, I didn't want to stop you. Um, but there are some just really fantastic questions about like inspiration. And, you know, you know, we talked a lot, or you talked a lot about, you know, kind of where your ideas come from, or not really starting with ideas and kind of starting with like, you know, just the process and then kind of responding, you know, as you go along. Um, but there's, yeah, definitely questions about inspiration. There's questions about, um, you know, how do you know when a painting is done? I think that's like an age oh, that's, like artist. That's a great question, yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, I think the thing is like, the, this is tied into the question of like, what is a good or bad painting? And I think how I would answer that is, um, it's, it's when you recognize, when you recognize it, it's like you recognize it as your work or like you feel like, you feel like a connection to it. So it's a personal decision. It's no one else really knows what a good painting for you is. Like when other people give you advice on your paintings, it, the, the problem is, is that what they're, what they're liking about it is usually stuff they're familiar with. So they're responding to the aspects of your work that are similar to other work that they've seen. And they'll kind of latch onto that and they'll like those parts about it. And the parts that they either don't see or they don't like are the parts that are probably more unique to you. They're just not as familiar with that yet, but they could come to love that if they just were kind of given a chance. So the important thing about advice from other people is that it helps like it helps you see your work in different ways. And this is the most dangerous thing about being an artist is that you fall into these like ways of seeing your own work where you just see it the same way all the time and you can't like break out of seeing it that way. So like when other people tell you things about your work, the good thing about that is that it helps you see it in different ways. The bad thing is that it's like useless. It's like never helpful at all. But, um, you, you know, eventually you'll find that the things that really bother people about your work and you'll kind of like find what you can do with those <laughs> and turn that into your, there's, you'll find something. I mean, some people don't like phrasing it this way, like what you have to say, but I think that's fine. Like you'll find what you have to say and then you'll go to make a painting or whatever you decide to do, you know, write a piece of music or whatever. And, and if you recognize it as your own, then that's good. Like whatever it took to do that, you should just leave it like that. Like the, and I, I think also um, with painting, it's almost always better to do as little as possible. Like whatever, like in my, I do this in kind of a weird way, but like I just use like one size brush or just like, I'll pick out seven colors and just stick to those in the painting or something. Like I, I kind of create these arbitrary kind of limits, but it, it is good in a general sense to try to, if you can do the painting with as little as possible, get as much out of as little, that works really well in paintings. Like if you have to add like a ton of different stuff, like you can always add more to a painting, but it doesn't make it a better painting. Like you could always add nude figures. Like I could do that to my paintings and it would make them more interesting. <laughs> But it wouldn't necessarily make my paintings better, although it might make your paintings. I mean, in a different instance, it could be just the thing, you know. So that's why also why advice is so tricky. Because no one knows the full extent. No one else can see. You're the only person who can see what your work can be. No one else can see that. So. I think that's also really scary, though, like this kind of limitless openness, foreverness, 
where, you know, you can kind of get really stuck in that too, where it's like, I don't know what direction to go down because, you know, I haven't been given a set of rules, which is both an incredible thing about making art and also the scariest thing, right? Is that- Well, you just, you just start with what you did the last time. Like you don't have to start from scratch. Every, I, that's how I look at it. Like I have what I've already done. That's why I kind of keep the paintings up around me as I'm working. Like they're kind of like my safety net, you know? And then I just work from that. I mean, but you know, you you also have your yourself, your personality is kind of like that. You know, you're not gonna be, you, you're you gonna limit yourself in all kinds of ways that you're not aware of. You're not gonna be, there's tons of things you wouldn't even think of or that you wouldn't be okay, of if, okay with if you did. So I think, um, but I love the idea. I think this is a really healthy idea in the modern world that, um, that everyone can just make work in whatever style they think is appropriate to them. Like this idea that people used to have like in the 20th century that there were these periods and that you had to kind of figure out what the next period was and like the most perfect form of that. I think that was a really crazy idea. So I, I'm, it might be harder in some ways, but I think it's healthier to have this idea that that really kind of any, it's kind of, a, I mean, it's not totally true. There still are like fashions, but I think that people do have kind of an openness these days to people working in different styles or different, like, you know, it's not like, like no one would be like, well, now it's just abstract art. <laughs> you have to make an abstract painting. It has to be flat. Like no one would ever say that anymore, which is great. Um, I think all that's fantastic. Um, Angelia in the chat, has asks about, um, you know, struggling with abstraction and um, is it just the notion of saying yes to everything? What advice would you give someone that appreciates abstraction but struggles to create it? Okay, yeah, so I think that there, there is a lot, like, like people just, like I, my experience with abstraction is that there's a lot of pushback. Like people may not want to admit this in public, but a lot of people just don't like it. People on the right don't like it because they don't think it depicts anything. They're like, it's paint, they're, they think it's like paintings of nothing. People on the left think that it's like paintings that don't mean anything. So they can be used as just like market tools or something. So there is a lot of like pushback. And I think that um, for me, I was kind of freed from that because I, one of my early influences, you know, I grew up in this like religious family and they were all like, a lot of them were musicians and like church musicians and they listened to classical music. And so I grew up listening to classical music. So I had this idea of, um, that's where I developed my idea of art. Actually, my first idea of art came from listening to classical music. Um, and, and so the idea that art could be abstract was very natural to me. And the idea that because no one ever has this idea that music doesn't mean anything. Like you wouldn't say Mozart doesn't mean anything. Like even, even like a piano sonata, it, of course it means something. Like that's a, the craziest thing that has, it's full of emotional content and it, it like, you know, it, he's like telling you all this information in it. Um, so I, I felt that was kind of my gift, I guess, for my parents is that I, I, um, I've, for me, it was never a question of the, like abstraction was always something that I thought was a very legitimate way to express yourself. Now, like, how do you, how do you figure out like what, like say you want to make an abstract painting, but you don't know what kind of abstract painting to make. I don't know. I was never, I never really had that. The shape thing just kind of happened and I just kind of went with it. So I would say maybe like, don't overthink it. Just like make a like make, like have a bunch of like sheets of paper and just make a bunch of things and then just like see if like what looks the most interesting to you and like pick that one and then make a bunch of things off of that. I mean, people underestimate how much you have to work to get anything done. It's a lot of work. It's just like a lot of work. Like you might think you only have to make 20 of something but you might have to make a hundred. You might have to make 200. You know, you, you, it just like you have got to work through a lot of stuff. And then eventually you'll start to see things that interest you more and you can just like go in that direction and take out the things that are less interesting and just like make it, like you make a drawing and there's one little bit, you're like, oh, that bit is great. So make a drawing that's just like all, like all that bit. And then there's part of that, that's the most interesting part. And then make a drawing that's like all about that, you know, and just like follow it where it goes. Yeah. Uh, Richard, how many paintings do you think you've made in your lifetime? Oh, don't ask. 
too many, way too many. I have my, not only is my studio filled with- Where do they go? Yeah. I have a storage space. Because I see probably like 30 in just your frame, just like in your room. So I'm just wondering where- I mean, there's probably like 80 paintings in my studio or something. I don't know. It's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. It's more paintings yeah. than ever anyone's ever going to want. What are you going to do with them all? I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. I don't really worry about that. Yeah, I just make them. Just make them. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, Richard, can you um, stop sharing your screen? Yes. Thank stop you. Sharing. And then I'm just going to ask, um, we're going to end this pretty soon, but I just want to see if anybody else has any final questions. There's a ton of like questions in the chat. Um, and hopefully we were able to kind of get to some of them. I, I feel like we could sit here and chat about Richard's work for a long time. Um, but is there any final questions like really, really, you know, that you, you have to ask Richard, maybe orally if anybody wants to. Anyone? Sure. No. Okay. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Were you, did you say me? <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so I had heard you mention earlier that you, there was a period of time where you were not showing your work to anybody and you were just kind of do do you feel like that was apprehension do you feel like that was you just trying to discover yourself without influence from other people no one wanted to see it <laughs> but you didn't put it I out mean, there so do you know <laughs> what well i was trying i was trying oh like, okay. I had, okay like it, like i had a thesis show you know i mean i did i was i mean i was tr i don't know like i it's obviously i could have done more that's true too I mean, I guess I was, um, I don't know, but I yeah. I just feel that, I feel that so much because like, especially when it's a new idea or like, I, I really struggle to put it out there and then I'm just like, okay, whatever. It is what it is, you know, I'm gonna put it out there. I'm gonna see what happens. And so I just, I just related to that heavily, I yeah. guess, and wanted to maybe a little more insight on that if it was like apprehension or like you were saying, you people weren't interested in that at the time. I felt, I didn't feel, I, I didn't really feel, I don't remember really feeling apprehension. I felt like I was, I just remember being not that worried about it. But I, the thing I would say as advice in situations like that, where you feel like you've got something you want to show, but you don't feel like people are paying any attention is the best advice I think in those situations is to get together with your friends and do something on your own. Because as like clickish as and kind of like self-centered as the art world is, they hate feeling left out. So it's like um, like if they feel like something's going on and no one told them about it, they'll get they'll be really <laughs> interested. So I think that's always like the best. Like think about the Harry Who's. I think the Harry Who's a perfect example. Like everyone in the '60s in Chicago, everyone was like, "No art comes from Chicago." And they're like, "We're just gonna do our own thing." And then everyone was like, "Oh, that's so interesting." <laughs> So I think that, you know, some things like that, where you, instead of like, um, you know, hitting your head against a wall, you just like do, there's, I think there's lots of things, you, like looking back, there probably is more I can do. I could have done. That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th I love your work and I loved this talk and thank you. you shared and the advice you gave, especially um, when it comes to abstract. I'm always so curious as to like what kind of mindset I need to have in order to create like great abstract work so yeah I don't really that, a lot. it's a good question I never I have to say I didn't really think about think about it but um yeah um, I mean I think my only advice would be to just try different things out and just see how you feel about it right just yeah. kind of go from there like I don't know just like this like the stupidest things you can think of just anything really is, yeah. is a starting point you'd be surprised like Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think that's great advice. So I appreciate it a lot. Well, thank you. I do too. I think like, you know, I think that's a great way to kind of end too, is to kind of think about living in the yes um, and kind of, you know, thinking about all the different possibilities that, you know, are out there in art and otherwise. And, and you know, kind of when you do explore that, what happens and what does that look like? And, you know, it really opens up, I think, a lot of directions that you wouldn't have otherwise done. And, you know, getting stuck in kind of one route, one tunnel, I think can be really problematic for artists. And I think that, you know, that's something maybe that, um, and I think Richard was talking about it earlier, but one thing that like, you know, gallerists and museums and things like that really want you to fit into some sort of like box 
you know, but I think like, um, at least for me as an artist, and I think talking to Richard too, um, you know, it's like about kind of opening things up and really kind of allowing ourselves to, to delve into whatever ideas that we're interested in. And I think how, how important that really is. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, but thank you so much, Richard. Thank you so much for being here and sharing everything with us, your process and ideas and everything. Um, it's such a pleasure. We're all such fans. Um, so thank you again for coming. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, again, this is recorded. So everything will be on Archer Gallery's YouTube channel. You can also check it out on our uh, website, which is archergallery.space. All of our exhibitions, art talks and everything are on there. Um, upcoming dates and things like that are also listed on there. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you everyone so much. And we will see you hopefully in two weeks at Tamara Seals um, Art Talk then. Okay. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you.